We've been talking about choosing building materials in the last week. Now, a great many factors influence the choice of building materials. You can't make a house of cards, right? And people who live in glass houses and all that. Anyhow, today I'd like to say a few words about flooring. Some artificial materials can be used, like plastic, for instance, which offer mixed blessings when used as a flooring surface. On the one hand, plastic is cheaper than nearly any other alternative, short of bare ground. Plastic also does not warp like wood. On the other hand, the best that can be said about plastic is that it looks like wood or stone. However, it cannot replace the real materials. As I have mentioned, I'm fixing up a new house. The decorator my wife hired told me plastic does a great job of looking exactly like plastic. Besides, it scratches easily, fades or discolors, and starts cracking within a year or two. So, if you're fitting out a sleazy hotel or plan to live in a trailer park, go with the plastic. Really, though, for all intents and purposes, this leaves us with wood or stone as choices for flooring. Stone and wood are alike in at least one respect. Both go through processing before they can be put to use. Since few of us cut our own lumber or quarry our own stone, this is not perhaps a pressing concern. Still, do-it-yourselfers would do well to remember to buy only properly seasoned wood. Unseasoned wood warps, and a warped floor quickly becomes firewood, and its owner quickly becomes poorer. Likewise, except for dull-hued materials like slate or sandstone, most stone floors are polished before installation. The choice goes well beyond just wood or stone. Each type requires many further considerations. A few special remarks are called for when considering wood. For example, as always, aesthetics, personal taste, and layout all play roles, as well as the type of house or room. Oh, and certainly don't forget the cost. When it comes to cost, a rule of thumb is that the softer and less exotic the wood, the lower the cost. In the U.S., for instance, pine is both ubiquitous and cheap. Mahogany is imported and exorbitantly expensive. If you're on any kind of budget when remodeling, it's really helpful to remember to go for the softer woods. Aside from cost, there are still lots of different factors that are important in choosing the best flooring for the job. Continuing with the example of wood, one must consider the effects of each type of wood on the mood of the room. When selecting the best wood to use, particular attention needs to be paid to its grain patterns, texture, and color. In rooms where relaxation or deep thought is the aim, say bedrooms or the study, dark, strong-grained woods are the rule. Here, the grain ought to match the furniture for a feeling of homogeneity. In rooms where activity and motion are typical, the dining room or living room, lighter, finer-grained lumber is more suitable. In such a setting, the wood grain might be useful in offering a contrast to the furniture. This leads to a feel of subconscious excitement in keeping with the room's function. In either case, though, consult a decorator. It is a decorator's job to know what materials to use to fit the function of the room. Though some things about putting together a room are subjective and based on one's individual taste, materials appropriate to a room's function are much more straightforward. A decorator takes the needs of the customer and uses a mathematical formula rather than subjective words. Since feelings vary from person to person, verbal descriptions of wood types tend to be ambiguous. You want the wood you select, not something approximate. And if you do decide to do it yourself, remember that all wood must be treated with preservatives to enhance its appearance and preserve its natural beauty. In the case of stone or quarry tile, as flat-cut flooring stone is properly called. A new set of considerations must be weighed up. Simple colour aside, the degree of reflection must be kept in mind. This is called the reflectance rate, which is expressed in a number between 0.0, .0 and 1.0, depending on the amount of light it reflects. At one end of the scale is polished silver. At a rating of 1.0, this shiny surface reflects nearly all of the light directed at it. Numbers closer to zero describe materials that absorb more light. Moving down the scale a bit, we see the plastic that has been painted white has a rate of 0.8, which makes sense. We know that the color white reflects all other color, while black absorbs all color, and plastic itself is a relatively reflective material. Materials that are denser and darker have reflectance rates much closer to zero. The quarry tile I mentioned a while ago has a rate of 0.1. 
As you may know, quarry tile is generally dark brown and made from clay, so it is quite dense. Of course, there is considerable variation among types of quarry tile because of the hue or treatment of the clay during its creation. Does anyone have any guesses as to what material may have a rate of almost 0.0? .0? We can guess most of these materials are black in colour, but plastic, wood and even stone reflect some light. One material with a rate of almost 0.0, .0 is black velvet. The texture produces almost no shine at all. Carrera marble, despite its white hue, is actually lower in reflectivity than black onyx. In any case, the fact that tiles vary somewhat should not be forgotten. A highly reflective floor would not be suitable in a library. It would be indispensable in a ballroom, should your home be large enough to feature one. Again, a rule of thumb is that light means lively. Since form and material follow function, one should only use the more reflective materials in rooms where the cultivation and expression of energy is important. Bear in mind, too, that most types of stone cost more than all but the rarest of wood. Of course, there is no reason why some rooms of a house should not feature wood floors or other stone tiles. You can even mix the two. A room with wood panels on the walls can have a beautiful stone floor. My bedroom has white birch walls and a light blue slate floor. The place looks like a Russian hunting lodge. Remember though, go with what feels right for you. Good taste and the laws of interior design are the homeowner's servants, not his master. It's only beautiful when you decide it is. I mean, you're the one who lives there, not the decorator, right? Okay, are there any questions? Good afternoon and welcome to Insect Biology 101. I'd like to begin this course with a few remarks about good insects and bad ones. Bugs are all around us, and that's both a benefit and an annoyance, sometimes maybe even serious harm. First, let's talk about the good things that insects do for us. Probably the most important insect for humans, and maybe for all other life, is the bee. Bees help plants in the process of pollination, and thus are necessary to most flowers and fruit-producing trees. That is, they carry pollen from male flowers to female. If it weren't for bees, we'd have very few food plants and no fruit either. In fact, there would be no we. No lesser thinker than Albert Einstein pointed out that, without bees, humanity would be dead within a year or less. We'd starve. It's that simple. That should maybe make us just a little humble. A little less dramatic is the fact that bees also make the honey we eat. Moreover, they produce beeswax, which is useful in candles and is also used as a first-rate furniture polish. Sure, these may not be vital to our lives, but they can serve as reminders of how important bees are. That's a point I keep coming back to in this course. Though, in all fairness, I should point out that butterflies aid in pollination as well as bees. Now, here in Michigan, what's the worst part of summer? Yep, that's right, mosquitoes. But I'm talking about helpful insects, right? So let's look at the dragonfly first. If there were no dragonflies, there would be even more mosquitoes. Dragonflies mainly eat mosquitoes and also a few other insects. Yes, that's right. They don't just fly around. And they also help to eliminate harmful insects. So the next time you see a dragonfly, don't you dare kill it. Now, let's talk a little about those harmful insects. Take the mosquitoes I just mentioned as an example. Not so many years ago, mosquitoes here in America weren't just annoying, some were even deadly. They carried malaria and yellow fever. My own ancestor, the Confederate General John Bell Hood, lived through the worst battles of civil war, only to die at age 38 from yellow fever. A pest, not a bullet. Well, besides the mosquitoes, in summer there is also a kind of insect that never seems tired. Right, that is the fly. Before I go on talking, I must mention an African fly called the tsetse fly, which feeds on blood and can cause serious diseases in the people and animals that it bites. Besides, it is still a bearer of sleeping sickness, which affects around 300,000 people every year in Africa and can be treated only with toxic drugs that are hard to administer. Worse still, the drugs sometimes don't work. Other insects, of course, destroy food crops. 
In China, for instance, locusts continue to be a danger to the harvest in some areas. Less important, but still annoying, moths eat people's clothes and dust mites slowly destroy carpets. Worse, but still in the home, termites or white ants eat wood, the wood of your house. If they are not stopped, they can eventually destroy the whole building. Usually they seriously damage a building before anyone even notices them. So, as we all know, insects can be a real trouble. So, what to do? You can go ahead and start killing harmful insects. In the early decades after the communist revolution in China, Chairman Mao encouraged the people to swat every fly they could see. Slogans on the walls of buildings called them little capitalists. But flies reproduce too quickly for this to be a long-term solution. For some decades in the West, to kill insects with chemicals seemed a good remedy. Unfortunately, chemicals can only be used in a limited area for a limited time. It's a small-scale solution. The insects come back. Worse still, some of the poisons used, like DDT, were found harmful to the environment. Many kinds of wildlife, like hawks, were harmed. And people in chemical-using rural areas have one of the highest rates of liver cancer in the world. It's no secret that chemicals remain harmful to humans. Like all species, insects adapt to their changing environments at an amazing rate. When a new chemical is introduced to their habitat, the insects that survive are generally the ones with some way of resisting the harmful effects. They then breed with the other survivors, and just like that, insects become resistant to most poison in a few generations. An insect generation, remember, is a couple of months at most. So, again, we have to ask, what to do? Well, there are biological solutions. Some of these are pretty simple. One is destroying the insect's habitat. You take away their home or food. Cleaning your kitchen is the best way to prevent roaches. No garbage, no food. Getting rid of marshes and swamps eliminates mosquitoes. Other solutions might include bringing in dragonflies or bats in areas where mosquitoes are many. This is a cheaper alternative to chemicals. Biological methods like this also bring no extra pollution to the environment. But you have to be careful. If you change the environment too much, you might be hurting other forms of life accidentally. One recent method of controlling insect populations involves interrupting their breeding cycle. What does that mean? It means birth control for bugs. Insects are provided with food that makes them unable to reproduce. Since they can't have babies, the population disappears, or nearly so. And since no young are born, resistance is not a problem, with no young insects developing increased resistance. Interrupt the life cycle, eliminate the bug. It's clear that we must have an understanding of the life cycle of the insect. At least, that's the plan. We'll go into more detail as the course goes along. Now, I will stop here to see whether you have any questions or not. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our exhibition, Two Centuries of the Bike. Let's stroll around the exhibition, shall we? Although there were a few early efforts back in the 1700s, you didn't really see many bikes till, say, the 1830s in England. Bikes were a response to the rapid growth of cities early in the 19th century. Cities like London were getting too big to walk across. The early bike let people travel with less effort than walking. Plus, a bike was a lot cheaper than a horse. Think of it. No one invited a bike for, what, 5,000 years of human history. Why did people do it then? Probably because this was the start of the machine age. People wanted machines to do all the work. There were some drawbacks, however. For one thing, there were no pedals. You simply pushed yourself along using your feet, kind of like today's skateboard. That meant you went fairly slow, and uphill you actually worked harder, pushing that two-wheeler. Plus, the wheels were made of wood covered with metal, as you can see from this model. So the downside was that the ride was quite uncomfortable on most roads. Only a few gadget lovers had or used them. 
By the 1860s, though, improvements were being made. As you can see from this specimen, metal frames had become the rule. They are more durable than wood, and they don't warp in the rain. The biggest improvement, however, was the development of the chain and sprocket system. They are connected. This meant you did not push the bike. You used pedals, just like today. You had to try harder to balance, so it took some practice to figure out how to use the pedals. But it made the ride so much easier. As a result, the good thing was that you could ride a lot more smoothly and with very little effort. By the 1880s, another big change was the use of rubber wheels. These became pretty common at that time. Though the first ones were solid rubber, the ride was a good deal more comfortable than the old iron and wood system. This is a big consideration because the faster you go, the more you feel every bump. Air-filled tires, pneumatic tires, didn't really come into use till around the year 1900, as you can see from this exhibition over here. That made the ride even more comfortable. So by 1890 or so, people were going a lot faster and a lot more smoothly. There was one problem when you were going quickly and comfortably. Oh no, how do I stop? Yes, we all laugh now, but for a long time the only way to stop was to drag your feet. That didn't work very well, and it would be dangerous if you were going fast. In the crowded cities of those years, New York, Chicago and so on, you would get killed if you couldn't stop for, say, a streetcar. Plus, look at this bike. The front wheel is nearly a metre and two-thirds tall. They made them that way so you could see over people in wagons, but you couldn't drag your feet. This model is called a velocipede, a speed pedal. Another characteristic of the bike in this period is that it has two equal-sized wheels which signalled a big change in bikes. For with the velocipede, brakes appeared. If you wanted to stop, you just pushed the pedal backwards. Doing that stopped the back wheel of the bike. This technique worked a lot better than dragging your feet or jumping off the high seat there. This meant that bikes became a great deal safer. It would have been safer if people wore helmets, but the first bicycle helmet wasn't invented until years later, and even then, it was little more than a leather ball cap. It really wasn't until the 1970s that the bike helmet was modified to provide some real protection. Before continuing on to look at developments since the 1890s, let's say a word more about safety. Everyone knows if you're going downhill, you can get going dangerously fast. To go more than 100 kilometers an hour isn't all that difficult. But even on level ground, it's easy to go too quickly. On a city street, today's bicycles can be ridden at a speed of over 40 miles an hour over a short distance. That's about 64 kilometers an hour. Remember, you're on a bike, not in a car. There's nothing to protect you. People are killed in single bicycle accidents every day just from hitting the road. A good rule to remember is, if you're going faster than the cars, slow down. And please, wear a helmet. Nearly one quarter of the epilepsy cases come from head injuries in accidents on bikes and motorcycles. I don't mean to scare you, but safety is everyone's business. What? Now that's a good question. Why are today's bikes so much faster? Well, it's not just that today's athletes are faster. The answer is partly mechanical. If you look closely here at the back wheel, you'll see a number of gears. Changing gears is what makes those fast speeds possible. You can shift gears depending on the terrain and how hard you wish to pedal. So you can put it on a higher gear for downhill and a lower gear for uphill travel to make it easier to climb that slope. You'll notice this gear shifting mechanism is attached to the back wheel. And when the rider shifts on the handlebar gear shifter, the chain moves to the appropriate sprocket. And, speaking of changing gears, let's look over here at our Tour de France exhibit. OK, and welcome back. During the short break we just took, several of you approached me with questions. So, before going on with the orientation talk, I'd like to address those queries. As I found, if one person asks a question, probably a dozen others are wondering about the same thing. The first question is whether Wasamata University employs modules technology as an instruction method. The answer is yes, we do. At least that's what the university catalogue says. If some of you don't understand what modules technology is, don't worry. I googled the word but couldn't find it. Apparently though, it's a method of broadband wireless access. At least that's what an American company's website told me. But again, don't worry. 
If you need to know something more, your professor can tell you. Another question someone asked me was what tomorrow's workshop on research methods and skills was about. Well, research skills include any method you can imagine for finding and presenting any information you need. That's not just schoolwork either. Writing English, the native language for most of you, and finding a job are also research skills. And yes, those will be addressed in tomorrow's workshop. As you know, Wasamata University is one of this country's premier universities for the study of the dismal science, economics. Some of you, it seems, want to get a jump on their classmates. During the break, half a dozen of you came up and asked me where to find economics tomes. I know it's odd, but this school's library holdings are divided up between two libraries. Economics books are in the old library. If you look out of the window behind me, you can see it. It's the red brick building. Oh, before I forget, you economics types also need a lot of math, am I right? Well, those math books are neither in the old library nor in the new one. They can be found in the math department building. Why am I telling you this? Doesn't the invisible hand guide economists? Maybe it's good you asked. In 2008, that hand shoved most of the world economy off a cliff, didn't it? Now, I realise that most of you couldn't bring a computer printer or a photocopier from home. So, I'm sure you're already wondering where you can copy things like term papers, internet articles and things like that. I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is that there are a number of places you can make copies. These include both libraries and the student union building. Now the bad news. I'm sorry to say, most classroom buildings and academic departments do not have copiers students can use. So most of the large buildings you see around campus do not have copiers for students. The copiers there are reserved for professors and office staff. Oh yes, I nearly forgot to tell you. If you need to have printing done, all the copiers available to students are laser printers. Plus, for your convenience, you can pay using prepaid cards. You can get those in the Student Union building. That just covers the questions put to me. If you have more, please see me during the next break at 2.15. Right now though, I'd like to start to give you a rundown on the various facilities here on campus. That way you won't get lost so easily in the weeks to come. I've been told that this year's incoming class features a large number of married students and parents. So you must be wondering where to put the baby while you're in class. OK, right now we're in the Student Union building, right? Remember the big doors in front where you all came in? If you go out of the building, you can see the nursery is just on the other side of this building. It's only about 20 metres away. Convenient, eh? Next, we're all from different places around the country. Some of you are from other countries. That means we're pretty likely to get sick during the first months of school as we expose each other to many new viruses. So where's the doctor? Of course, you need to find the Medical Services Centre, which is on the right as you leave the building. Remember, that's the second building on the right. And if you look out of that window, you can see a lot of antenna and satellite dishes on the roof. So that's what we call the Media Centre. Yeah, I know, I think it's confusing too. The Media Centre is next to the Medical Centre. The chairwoman of the journalism school on the first floor doesn't like it when people who wander in there mistake her for a nurse. Chances are, you'll have at least one math class while you're here. That red building there, just outside to the left, is the math department building. I know, it looks about as old as the subject of math, but I assure you that the inside is equipped with state-of-the-art classroom equipment, including interactive chalkboards and surround sound in every room. Oh, can you see the back building there? Yes, behind the media centre. Quite new, isn't it? That's the new library, just decorated. They're back to back, you might say. If you look just to the left of it, at the lower, older looking building, you'll find the old library. It's nice and quiet, perfect for those marathon study sessions during exam week. Since the weather is so nice, why don't we stop looking at our maps, but go for a walk around the campus? Good morning, and welcome to yet another lecture in environmental science. I don't think I'm telling you a secret when I mention that water is a big worry here in Australia. The stuff is scarce. Perhaps that's why we drink so much beer, eh? 
Seriously though, a safe and reliable source of water is one of the great concerns of people everywhere. Moreover, as the world population grows, the pressure on existing water supplies grows greater and greater. Think about it. Our economic system demands that there be more and more consumers. The growing number of people has been tied to climate change, including droughts. So more people means less water. But our economic system demands a high birth rate. Forget about oil. Soon enough, you will see wars for water. Mark my words. But today, I'm going to confine my remarks to Australia. As noted already, here down under, the water supply is extremely scarce. The only drier continent is Antarctica, and remember, no one really lives there anyway. Moreover, in recent years, the wind patterns have changed. Rain that used to fall on the country now falls out to sea hundreds of miles to the south. Now, when I speak of people needing water, most of you probably think of drinking. Certainly, everyone needs water for drinking. But surprising as it may sound, drinking is not anywhere near being the main use for water. Most water is actually used for washing. When you take a shower, you probably use well over a hundred liters of water. Every time you flush your toilet, that's about eight liters. But most people drink no more than two liters or so per day. So, where to get water? It could be obtained from rainwater. But often rainfall consists of other harmful pollutants that evaporated with the water. In fact, acid rain, an intense example of this, causes harmful effects on the wildlife of the habitat on which it falls. Water from underground could also be used, though it is more difficult to contain and often must go through an extensive cleansing process. The purest water is found in rivers, creeks, lakes, and dams. And sad to say, Australia has precious few of these. Really, how many of your hometowns have rivers? Year-round rivers, I mean. The soil tends to be sandy, so water soaks into the ground. Many places are rocky too, so 87% of the rainfall is lost to evaporation. That's almost twice the evaporation rate in my native Canada. Speaking of rain, we already heard how rainfall is diminishing here in Oceania. The quantity itself isn't the only problem either. Going back to the problems with obtaining rainwater, a further problem is that rain is a useful source of water only if air pollution is fairly mild. Again, you're in a situation where you can't win. You need water where most people live. People tend to build cities where rainfall is adequate, but then modern cities tend to feature polluted air, which renders the rain far less easily usable. Okay. Let's take a look at the table here. You'll see it showing the relative pollution of rainfall in the world's cities. The more people, the dirtier the rain. This is becoming a huge concern for people in the West who want their water to be pure and safe. Though reliable drinking water is important everywhere, the concern in the West is reflected in all the government regulations and political campaigns aimed at solving this problem. In contrast, there are not as many demands made on the governments in Asian and African cultures to improve the water, as their focus is on other issues. Now, whatever the source of water, we can never afford to forget that all water is highly vulnerable to contamination. Whether we're getting it from the ground, from bodies of water, or rainfall, it is susceptible to a variety of toxins. In fact, that's why we clean it before using it. Water carries with it filth and dirt. This problem shows up in a number of different ways. As humans and all other animals need water to survive, it's no surprise to us that one of the most important domestic uses of water is for drinking. Yet, if you have old-fashioned lead pipes, you may slowly be poisoning yourself by drinking that nice, clear water. The industrial pollution. Farm chemicals and leaky landfills are well-known sources of contaminants as well. So, what is being done to ensure we Australians a safe and steady supply of drinking water? There are a lot of initiatives that make admirable efforts to remedy this issue. We'll be talking about this when we meet again on Thursday. But as a preview, I can tell you that so far the amount of real solutions that have been produced is not nearly adequate. Traditionally, we've been very free in this country. That means that every person in every province tend to go its own way. 
So the mechanisms for water management are, in a word, insufficient. To begin seeing how this is so, I want you to read something before our next class. Though a lot of previous data on water usage and water management are inconclusive and have thus caused quite a concern, we can learn a lot from the contents of reports written on the subject. The basis for the government's water policy is the 1989 White Paper reporting on water use, present and future. If you compare the numbers offered in the paper with those in the text, you'll find that the report is rather untrustworthy. Truth being told, I'm being too kind when I say that. Good morning. Today we will continue our study of Crocodilus nilotticus by talking about its living habits. We've already discussed the evolutionary attributes that set it apart from its crocodile relatives. Does everyone remember that? Yes, it has an extremely narrow snout and three or four rows of protective scales on its back, as compared to two rows on other members of the Crocodilus genus. Let's take a look at how these carnivorous man-eaters live, where they live, and finally, whether they really deserve their vicious reputation. To start, I'd like to address a great question posed to me by a student during yesterday's office hours. We talked about the distribution of crocodiles in Africa and saw that they are highly concentrated in the south and west of the continent. This student noticed that on the map displaying the distribution of crocodiles across Africa, there were no crocodiles in the northern region and found no mention in the literature of the existence of crocodiles in the north of Africa. Why might there be no crocodiles in North Africa? Let's save this question for later in the lecture. To find out more about the social habits of the African crocodile, one researcher named Tara Shine of the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland conducted a survey of the wetlands in Mauritania and received reports of 46 crocodiles living in one group, or float as we say when referring to crocodiles, though the usual number is a little less than half of that. In general, crocodiles are more highly concentrated in wet subtropical environments near bodies of water and rich vegetation. While South American crocodiles thrive in cool rainforests, the African crocodile is more equipped for heat. Though they can survive at the hot temperatures found in some deserts, they are not equipped to handle dry climates and thus cannot survive in places like the Sahara Desert of North Africa. As cold-blooded animals, crocodiles' core temperatures fluctuate from their average of 38 degrees Celsius as external conditions change. Thus, they need to avoid extreme temperatures. Others live an underwater life, keeping a body temperature close to that of the water. As their own unique method of regulating their body temperatures, some African crocodiles have made dens by digging holes in the ground to provide themselves with a cool, dark place to retreat from the hot African sun. Speaking of the hot African sun, let's go back to the question asked at the beginning of the lecture. We know that there used to be crocodiles in northern Africa, yet today there are none. What are some possible explanations for this? Some students have suggested that the African crocodile has evolved from a desert creature into a wetland creature, thus causing them to migrate south for more appropriate conditions. Others presume that the crocodile was hunted out of northern Africa by a fiercer predator. While these are intelligent guesses, the real story is a little bit different. The key to this migration is that the Sahara Desert did not always cover the north of Africa. About 8,000 years ago, the land was fertile wetlands, perfect for breeding crocodiles. Over time, though, the area dried out and the wetland slowly turned to desert, leading the African crocodile to migrate south to the marshlands they call home today. Some crocodiles did, however, adapt to living in dry conditions. In Mauritania, some crocodiles have learned to survive in an area where they can go up to eight months with no water by spending the driest of times in what's called a torpor or short period of hibernation. 
To utilize every bit of rainfall, these desert crocodiles dig underground caves that collect runoff, thus staying cool and hydrated. During the mating period in November and December, males attract females to their viciously protected territory through a number of behaviors that range from snapping their jaws all the way to sending infrasonic pulses through the water. Afterwards, the female digs a hole up to 60 centimeters in depth to store the eggs for an 80-day incubation period. The female protects these eggs during the period and sometimes even helps crack the eggs with her snout at the end. These teeth-gnashing carnivores are softer than we think. Although these vicious creatures have attacked humans on a few occasions, the residents are not afraid of them. In fact, they show a great deal of reverence towards these wondrous creatures. Some say that crocodiles bring water to their habitat, so if they leave, they will bring the water with them. Obviously this is not true, but it demonstrates the admiration the inhabiting people have for crocodiles. Generally, crocodiles do not predate on humans. They attack when humans populate the crocodile's habitat, instilling fear and uneasiness in the crocs. Like any other species, crocodiles are known to attack when feeling fear. There's still a lot more to be discovered about the African crocodile. Researchers want to know more about the population size, how many crocodiles inhabit Africa in all, how they form separate floats, etc. There is still also much to learn about migration patterns and relations to other populations of crocodiles now found in other parts of the world. Next time, we'll examine a few specific case studies of crocodile populations in southern Africa. Hello class and welcome back to Marketing Strategies. This week, I will expand upon last week's lecture by talking about factors you should consider when creating advertising materials and the effects they can have on your product sales. Lesson 1. Limit your advertising to the geographic area of your target market. Though you may have a product that people want in a large area, the distance that customers are willing to travel is a significant factor in their choice of where to purchase that product. Take this example. If you're really hungry and decide you want a burrito, would you choose the restaurant that is a block from your apartment or the one that is just as good or even slightly better across town? Of course, you'd pick the closer restaurant. Next, there's the method of communication to your target market. How do you decide among radio ads, TV commercials, flyers, or even word of mouth? While we often think of the visual presentation of ads, there's much more to advertising than the look. Studies show that consumers are much more likely to remember advertising slogans if there's also a sound plate. Did you know that your sense of smell is closely linked with memory? Think about Mandy's candy store up the road. Every time you walk past it, you can just smell the chocolate, right? I bet you can almost smell it now. Just mentioning the name brings about the smell memory and in turn, a chocolate craving. What better way to sell chocolate bars? Obviously, sometimes appealing to the senses isn't the most practical way to advertise. For example, it's a good idea to come up with a marketing strategy that adapts to the product, especially digital products. The flexibility of this kind of products is extremely important, so it's very common for advertisers to form one single layout for all of their ads, the visual, the medium, even the majority of the content, and simply update the ad each time they come out with a new version. Remember, Advertising is all about stirring up the right feeling in your potential customers, whether by stimulating the senses, appealing to the intellect, and so on. Once the customer experiences the ad, the important thing is his or her reaction. Someone could love the ad you made, but unless he or she considers buying the product, you failed to get the reaction you were looking for. So once you have successfully reached your target customer and you have his or her business, often you'll want to expand to a larger market. More often than not, the same marketing strategies you used 
in your small campaign may not work for a larger audience. The larger you scale your product, the more factors you must consider. For instance, Apple operates worldwide, so they must tailor their advertising for each market they enter. Often you'll see Apple ads on international flights that appear not only in English, which is the lingua franca of most regions, but also in the native languages of the majority of passengers. I travelled to Russia last week, and it was really interesting to see the same Nike ad that I've seen a hundred times, except this time it was in Russian. OK, going back to the medium of the advertisement, even after choosing to create print ads instead of radio announcements, television commercials, etc., there is more to consider. If you print your ad in a newspaper, it will be read by a far different audience than if you print your ad in a popular magazine. Would you put an ad for the new Justin Bieber album in a newspaper? Probably not, because that product is most suitable for youths. Let's face it, do you know anyone under the age of 25 that buys a newspaper? No. Now let's try a few strategy exercises. Imagine you're a company that is aiming to improve the environment by making products that reduce human waste. How would you advertise your product? Clearly it would send the wrong message if you put up flyers or other materials that cause lots of waste paper. Consider instead putting commercials on the Health Channel or buying ad space on websites like UNESCO. Well, here's another example. What is one great place to advertise suntan lotion? How about a swimming pool? It has the exact group of people that need the product. All right, one last thing. Let's say you're filming a commercial for a water filter pitcher. What would be good scenery to use for the background? Think about somewhere calm and relaxing with clean, fresh water. Can't you see how much more effective a commercial with the beautiful scenery and flowing rivers of a national park would be than, say, water dripping from a tap? So to wrap things up today, think about the geography of your target market, the type of marketing material you should use, and the most effective way to appeal to the customer in order to make a successful ad campaign. That is all I have for you today. Make sure to read through Chapter 8 for Monday if you have not done so already. OK, now I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Good morning. Today I am going to cover the daunting task of giving a quality speech, a thought that makes most of us cringe. In fact, 90% of all people feel nervous about public speaking, about 10% of whom are described as genuinely terrified. Hopefully, when we are finished here today, you all will be in the 10% of the population who do not feel nervous at all. Did you know that lecturers tend to get more nervous if the speech they are giving is an important one? It makes sense, right? You probably wouldn't be nearly as nervous to address your residence hall about the proper use of the recycle and compost bins as you might be if you were asked to give the graduation speech to your entire 5,000 student class. So what is it that makes some people completely comfortable in front of crowds? Some people think that the ability to give a good speech is a gift that others are simply born with. This is almost never the case. Public speaking can be learned with practice. The first most important thing you can do to improve your confidence in delivering a speech is to prepare a quality speech. Honestly, while the content of your speech is relatively important, the audience will really only remember the last sentence you say. It is a good idea to structure the rest of your speech to lead up to this last point to really drive your message home. This is a good way to ensure that your speech is well organised. Once you are confident in the quality of the speech you have written, the rest is just about your stage presence. Let's go through some do's and don'ts of public speaking. First, you want to command the attention of the room. Do not, I repeat, do not proceed with your speech until the audience is paying attention. Even Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech wouldn't have made any difference in the world without the undivided attention of his audience. 
To continue with the I have a dream example, one of the reasons that MLK was such an effective orator was his ability to speak with passion and engage with his audience. That sort of charisma does not come from reading straight from paper. Don't get me wrong, it is a good idea to write your main ideas down on a note card, sheet of paper or something. But one factor that will consistently lead to a boring, forgettable speech is writing down your entire speech. Do not write your full speech down. If you are constantly reading your paper, you are not making eye contact with your audience and thus failing to really express the feeling that goes with your ideas. I advise you write one or two ideas, so if you suddenly draw a blank, you have something to jog your memory. If you've written a good speech that you believe in, those ideas should be sufficient to keep you on track. Once you have those ideas written down, give your speech a few practice runs in front of the mirror, into your sound recorder on your phone, or with a friend before it comes time to address a crowd. That way, you can hear how the ideas come across, make sure there are no abrupt transitions, and find out whether you are talking too fast or too slow. Timing is important. Make sure you time yourself beforehand to see how long your speech is. That is pretty much it. With practice, you'll be able to deliver an expert speech that engages and even maybe inspires your audience. Just remember, speak with emotion. No one wants to listen to someone reading from a script. As I come to a close in my speech, I'll point out that I have employed all of these tips that I have covered. I practiced my speech ahead of time and timed it, and I can even show you my one small index card with just three simple bullets on it. It's as easy as that. Good afternoon. In the last few lectures, we've been covering the social and political pressures that influenced the rise of the rebellion of 1679. Today, I would like to focus on the Pleasanton Town Market. Now, why are we talking all about some market? It's not like it was the first market ever, or even a particularly large market. The Pleasanton Town Market is important because it is often mentioned in the literature found in the library. If you have ever been there, you have probably seen all of the handcrafted items sold there now. But what was originally bought and sold in the town market? In the beginning, the market sold products such as meats, furs and simple tools. Over time though, it became known as the place to find quality livestock. People came from all over the world to find the biggest and best cows, pigs and chickens. In fact, the profits from the town market became the saviour of a plummeting economy during a time of much turmoil. Not to be confused with the Reconstruction era, a period of rapid development came about in the 1660s as a result of the market's vendors contributing their profits to building up much needed public facilities and defence, which would later make a huge impact on the outcome of the war. For many years the market flourished and began to draw in large tourism crowds in addition to the throngs of livestock customers. However, as revolutions in farming came about, more people moved to farms far from the city centre. Customers grew more and more reluctant to travel all the way to the town centre for their meats when they could easily choose to buy from local farmers near them for a fraction of the price. With such a fall in the profits of the town's major profit generator, some quality town planning was needed. In the mayoral election of 1668, a young man of little fame just barely claimed the popular vote, none other than the now legendary John C. Wiley. Wiley's first decision as mayor of Pleasanton was to deal with the quickly failing town market. The building with the large clock was a landmark that had symbolized growth in Pleasanton for a generation. Wiley decided to use the notoriety of the town market to set an example. During the historical Rotterdam Rebellion, Wiley gave all those involved lifetime prison sentences in the very same building. It stayed a prison for about 50 more years until they transported all remaining prisoners to other facilities and turned it into the historical monument today. Now that you know the basics of the history of the Pleasanton Town Market, I will introduce your next group project. I want you to make a short film based on the real historical events that occurred in Pleasanton before and during the uprising. 
I will give you some class time to look through the library's reference section, but you will be responsible for conducting further research outside of class. I suggest starting by looking for information on the market itself. You'll find plenty of information. In fact, some students complain that there is actually too much information on it. On your own time, you could find family members of old war veterans to conduct interviews. Sometimes they provide wonderful insight that you wouldn't find in proper history books. But be careful, an interview that is riddled with bias is useless. I myself have some very old photographs here that you are welcome to take a look at for some inspiration. I'm lucky enough to own this one of Jim Wiley himself. Very interesting to see, but does not provide enough information to add much to your film. Feel free to take this film into whatever direction you choose. You could even do a crime thriller based on real outlaws. All you would have to do is look through the newspaper archives in the crime section during that time period. Try to get as much detail as you can, but you may end up having to draw your own conclusions. Okay, that's enough from me, so let's go on to... Today, I'd like to tell you about how UK architects are playing their part to address the issue of global warming. You have seen many of these iconic buildings while going about your everyday life, but you may not know how they are affecting your tomorrow. In 2003, Construction was completed on the famous Swiss Rebuilding, or more informally called the Gherkin, a true masterpiece commissioned by the law offices of Foster and Partners. This is not the first ambitious endeavour of the firm. They are renowned for their various philanthropic environmental efforts. The Gherkin, with its cutting edge green initiative and sharp design, is gaining recognition as an icon in modern architecture. You can pick it out of the London skyline by its unorthodox cigar shape. While its appearance is the obvious attribute at which to marvel, there is far more to this building than meets the eye. And let's face it, there's a lot about this building that meets the eye. The building helps reduce the city's carbon footprint in a number of ways. Just a quick note, in case you're not familiar with the term carbon footprint, get used to it. It's a buzzword you'll hear relentlessly to talk about reducing emissions. Think of it as the amount of harmful greenhouse gases that are given off into the environment by a single person, organization or product. So going back to the Gherkin building, perhaps the most obvious as well as the most significant eco-friendly feature is the glass windows, which allow light to pass through the building, both reducing heating costs and brightening up the workspace. The ingenuity behind the various eco-friendly aspects of the Gherkin has seen its fair share of publicity both from serious and silly sources. In a recent April Fool's Day edition, one e-publication printed a story detailing plans to replace 50% of the current exterior with grass, which would not only make large steps in the name of sustainability, but also give the building the green hue that would truly earn it the nickname of the Gherkin. The only drawback is, as you may have guessed, that this story was an April Fool's Day joke and completely made up. In all seriousness though, the building is setting a new standard of design that other architects and city planners just cannot ignore. The building's bold and cost-efficient design has won a number of architecture awards, including the Stirling Prize, the London Region Award, and the Empress Skyscraper Award, among others. The design comfortably accommodates a large number of offices, while keeping maintenance and operation costs down, striking a superb balance between nature and the workplace. Nature is well and good, as long as the weather is nice outside. Given London's notoriously bad weather, the architects knew they must devise a quality temperature regulation system, and that they did. A special system designed to reduce the building's reliance on air conditioning was devised that cuts consumption in half compared to standard office buildings. There are atria that link each floor 
vertically to one another, forming spiraling spaces up the entire building. They serve not just as social common spaces, but also act as the building's lungs, distributing clean air from the opening panels in the facade through the entire building. The building isn't all business, though. It has its fair share of fun as well. At the very top, a club room offers a picturesque entertainment spot for company functions, private parties, etc., with a breathtaking panoramic view of the city. The creation of such an innovative structure has many wondering what the future of urban planning and architecture may be. Well, if the other projects currently commissioned by Foster and Partners are any indication, the entire city constructed with similarly eco-friendly buildings is not far in the distance. The Mazda City development aims to create a desert city that produces zero waste and removes as much carbon dioxide from the atmosphere as it puts in. A huge feat in protecting our Earth. The Gherkin is a truly impressive feat, yet it is not the only one worth noting. Now to move on to another green initiative, I'll tell you about the Eden Foundation building found in Cornwall. Tonight I'm going to present an overview of the research on amber. OK, I'll start by giving a brief introduction about amber, then talk about the formation of amber, and then describe amber's applications in different fields. First of all, what is amber? Amber is not a stone, but is ancient fossilized tree resin, which is the semi-solid amorphous organic substance secreted in pockets and canals through epithelial cells of the plant. And why is resin produced? Although there are contrasting views as to why resin is produced, it is a plant's protection mechanism. The resin may be produced to protect the tree from disease and injury inflicted by insects and fungi. Amber occurs in a range of different colors. Besides the usual yellow, orange, and brown, other uncommon colors are also associated with it. Interestingly, blue amber, the rarest Dominican amber, is highly sought after. It's only found in Santiago, Dominican Republic. There are several theories about what causes the blue color in amber. The most common one links it to the occurrence of volcanic dust that was present when the resin was first pressed out from Hymnaea Proterra millions of years ago. At this point, you might be curious about how amber is formed. Molecular polymerization resulting from high pressures and temperatures produced by overlying sediment transforms the resin first into copal. Sustained heat and pressure drives off terpenes and results in the formation of amber. Copal, that I've just mentioned, is also a tree resin, but it hasn't fully fossilized to amber. More generally, the term copal describes resinous substances in an intermediate stage of polymerization and hardening between gummier resins and amber. So where can we find amber? It can be found on seashores. The main producer worldwide is Russia. In fact, about 90% of the world's available amber is located in the Kaliningrad region of Russia, which is located on the Baltic. Here, the resin is washed up on the coast after being dislodged from the ocean floor by years of water and ocean currents. However, exposure to sunlight, rain, and temperate extremes tends to disintegrate resin. This also indicates that amber is not really an ideal fossil preservative for most uses. We've already learned that amber is made of tree resin. It often includes insects that were trapped within the tree many millions of years ago. A piece with a visible and well-arranged insect 
is generally valued much higher than simple solid amber. One Dominican amber source reported finding a butterfly with a five-inch wing spread. This is both a large and unusual find. And most butterfly specimens have no more than a two-inch wingspan. Inclusions in Dominican amber are numerous. One inclusion to every 100 pieces. A Baltic amber contains approximately one inclusion to every 1,000 pieces. Now that you have a basic knowledge of amber, I'd like to talk a bit about amber's application in different fields. First, amber is appreciated for its color and beauty. Good quality amber is used to manufacture ornamental objects and jewelry. For instance, using a variety of exclusive first-class quality natural Baltic amber with silver to make natural amber jewelry. But due to the biodegradation of amber fossils, people with amber jewelry have to take special care of it to ensure that the amber is not damaged. It was previously believed that amber worn on the neck served to protect one from diseases of the throat and preserved the sound mind. Calistrate, a famous doctor in the Roman Empire, wrote that amber powder mixed with honey cures throat, eye, and ear diseases, and if it is taken with water, eases stomachache. While the mystery around that use of amber has not been cleared. One thing is sure: it will help effectively to defeat small malaises. Amber has even been used as a building material. Amber created the altar in Saint Brigida Church in Gdansk, Poland. In Saint Petersburg, Russia, the walls of the famous Amber Room were lined with intricate carvings and inlaid designs. This palace room is being reconstructed from photographs. And can be visited at the Catherine Palace, located in the town of Tsarskoye Selo. And finally, the fourth use of amber is that. Good morning, everyone. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about the role of sleep in humans and animals. Of all the biological processes in the animal kingdom, sleep is perhaps the most important. A human can survive for almost two weeks without eating. But did you know that one week without sleep can be fatal? It's even worse for animals, especially for those who must avoid predators. Without sleep, an animal is much less capable of avoiding an attack. This is the case for all animals, whether they are reptiles, mammals, or fish. Let us look now at how different animals sleep, reasons for their ways of rest, and the potential problems they might encounter. In marine life, sleep must be balanced with breathing. For example, the dolphin must float to the surface as it sleeps in order to breathe. Like other large sea mammals, they keep one eye open and one half of the brain awake at all times to maintain some amount of consciousness required to breathe and to watch out for possible threats. They sleep with only one brain hemisphere in slow wave sleep. Birds also have unusual sleeping patterns. Mostly due to being constantly on edge in the presence of numerous predators, they usually sleep quite lightly. For example, Swainson's thrush, also called olive-backed thrush, is a medium-sized thrush that takes hundreds of naps during the day, each of which lasts just a few seconds. While migrating, migratory birds tend to function well on micro naps. Horses, on the other hand, do most of their sleeping standing up. Scientists think that horses developed their habit of sleeping upright as a defense mechanism, a way of protecting themselves against predators. And a standing position keeps a horse in a constant state of readiness to race away if danger should approach. Also, horses do occasionally take short naps lying down. Horses are heavy animals with big muscles, but their bones are surprisingly delicate. So lying in one position for a long time could well injure a horse. Just like humans, animals can also have sleeping problems. Dr. John Hendricks and Adrian Morrison from the School of Veterinary Medicine, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, determined that certain diseases were primarily associated with the sleep states in animals. 
In their research, they emphasized that because so much in this area still remains unclear, animal models were very important for studies of sleep disorders. The physiology of sleep in animals is similar to that of humans. But why do we humans sleep? Researchers and scientists believe it helps us organize our memories of the day, that sleep acts as a kind of filing system for the brain. Without it, our thoughts become disorderly and confused, which leads to increased likelihood of accidents and a tendency to say and do bizarre things. Researchers also believe that sleep plays a key role in learning. We sleep so that the brain can integrate new knowledge and form new associations. Because of the similar sleeping pattern to that of humans, rats are often studied in order to increase our knowledge of human physiology. In one study, rats were kept awake for almost two weeks and their behavior was observed. Researchers found the sleep-deprived rats could hardly remember anything of what they had been taught that day. For example, one rat had been taught to recognize pictures of various Parisian landmarks in order to receive food. Pressing a button below a picture of the Louvre would result in food being released and so forth. However, when deprived of sleep, they would press buttons seemingly at random. In addition to rats, the fruit fly, a small insect that feeds and breeds on spoiled fruit, also has been used as a model organism and thousands of scientists around the world work on it. But why was the fruit fly chosen to be studied? It was for practical reasons. The most important one is that the relationship between fly and human genes is so close that the sequences of newly discovered human genes, including genes that show a susceptibility, can often be matched against their fly counterparts. This provides an indication of the function of the human gene and could help in the development of effective drugs to help people with sleeping disorders. Therefore, many scientists today choose to study the genetic structure of the fruit fly which could make a particularly important contribution to the understanding of developmental processes in humans. In conclusion, sleep is a necessary part of life, not just for humans, but for the entire animal kingdom. Now, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Welcome back to my series of short lectures on apes. Today we will examine recent and historical breakthroughs on the behavior of chimpanzees, otherwise known as chimps. The word chimpanzee is an umbrella term for two different species of apes in the genus Pan, which are the common chimpanzee or Pan troglodytes found in West and Central Africa, and the bonobo or Pan paniscus, which are found in the forests of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Chimpanzees belong to the hominidae family, together with gorillas, orangutans, and indeed humans. Current research tells us that the chimps broke away from the human branch of the hominidae family approximately six million years ago and remain the closest living relative to humans to this day. More modern researchers into chimpanzees have centered on their behavioral characteristics once all biological and genetic factors have been ruled out. In this way, scientists have unearthed an unfathomable amount of similarities between human and chimpanzee behavior. Although much of this research has taken place through observation of captive chimps, the results are widely seen as an authoritative reflection of chimps living in the wild. Chimps live in large so-called communities comprised of many male and female members, with the social hierarchy determined by an individual chimp's position and influence. Through such research, scientists have found that chimps learn and adapt through observation of others' behavior. Once in power, the alpha male is often seen to alter its body language in order to retain power. For example, he might puff himself up in order to intimidate others. While lower-ranking chimps are noted to behave more submissively and holding out their hands while grunting. Female chimpanzees also have a distinct social hierarchy, with high social standing inherited by children. It is not unheard of 
for dominant females within a community to unite and overthrow the alpha male, backing another in his place. James Diamond, in his book The Third Chimpanzee, suggests that chimps should now be reclassified in the genus Homo instead of Pan, and there are many arguments still in favour of this. Male common chimpanzees are, on average, 1.7 metres in height, weighing 70 kilograms, with their female counterparts being somewhat smaller. By comparison, the bonobo is slightly shorter and lighter, but with longer arms and legs. However, both species walk on all fours and climb trees with great ease. Jane Goodall made a groundbreaking discovery in 1960 when she observed the use of tools among chimpanzees, including digging for termites with large sticks. A recent study claimed to reveal that common chimpanzees in Senegal have been using spears sharpened with their teeth to hunt. However, these reports remain unsubstantiated. Researchers have witnessed such tools, namely rocks, being used by chimps to open coconut shells and indeed crushing nuts with stone hammers. As scientific technology has developed, so too has our knowledge of the sheer extent of the chimps' intelligence. Research has now shown that chimps have the capability to learn and use symbols and understand aspects of the human language including syntax, as well as numerical sequences. As I mentioned earlier, the umbrella term chimpanzee is comprised of the common chimpanzee and the bonobo. These two subspecies are divided along the Congo River, with the common chimps living on one side and the bonobos living on the opposite side of the river. Over the past few decades, both of these subspecies have witnessed an alarming decrease in population density, with animal activists now working harder than ever to protect those remaining and encourage procreation. In addition, next week's episode will focus more closely on how chimpanzees in captivity are able to learn things through imitating the behavior of humans, as well as how chimpanzees' behaviors have developed over many generations. Thank you very much for attending this evening's lecture. I hope you found it intellectually stimulating, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Good night. Great Britain is often hailed as the home of football, with talented players travelling from far and wide to play for teams in the English Premier League, one of the most popular football leagues on the planet. Today we are going to take a look back to the 19th century Great Britain in an attempt to trace the evolution of the beautiful game as it is now known. Prior to the 19th century, the game featured a wide variety of local and regional adaptations which were later smartened up and made more uniform to create our modern-day sports of association football, rugby football and Ireland's Gaelic football. Even up to the mid-19th century, Shrovetide football, or mob football, was still widely practiced. According to the rules of mob football, there were no rules. A player could legally use any means whatsoever to obtain the ball, such as kicking, punching, biting and gouging, with the only exceptions being murder and manslaughter. These games may be regarded as the ancestors of modern codes of football, and by comparison with later models of football, they were chaotic and had few cooperation. Towards the latter end of the 19th century and moving into the early part of the 20th century, however, there appeared a newfound emphasis on moral values in football. Perhaps a more modern example of this can be seen in John Terry's suspension as England captain, following reports of his infidelity to his wife. Furthermore, as mob football died away, there grew a greater concern for players' health and general well-being, with many clubs affording their top players access to frequent medical checkups and treatment. Despite the presence of Great Britain's unique, state-funded National Health Service, football clubs are still seen today 
providing team members with state-of-the-art healthcare facilities, with the top clubs even housing their own specialist doctors and physicians. Today, football is a key feature of school children's day-to-day -day education, particularly for boys. With the help of football associations, all schools in the UK are boasting their own football teams. This mainly comes as a result of pressure put on schools and the government by concerned parents, who felt that football education taught their children valuable lessons and indeed vital life skills, such as teamwork and a drive to succeed. Nowadays, many of the UK's top football clubs provide training facilities and outreach programmes in an attempt to educate the nation's aspiring youths. As I previously mentioned, it was only during the 19th century that football in its uniform concept truly began to emerge. With footballers previously playing according to their own versions of the rules. However, it was not until the early 20th century that different players actually began to play according to these standardized rules. Prior to the 19th century, football was played by all the major English public schools, including the likes of Eton College, Winchester College, and Harrow. In 1848, there was a meeting at Cambridge University in an attempt to lay down the laws of football. Present at the meeting were representatives of each of these major public schools, whom each brought a copy of the rules enforced by their own individual school's rules of football. The result of the meeting was what is now known as the Cambridge Rules, thereby uniting the rules from across the country into one simple document. However, the Cambridge rules were not liked by all, and a new set of rules, Thring's rules, compounded in the book The Simplest Game, became commonplace among dissenters. Across the country, improvements in infrastructure and public transport had a knock-on effect of dramatically increasing attendance to football games. Football quickly became a social event where spectators would meet friends, drink tea and chat about the good old days. As football became more and more popular, it was decided that more money should be invested in maintaining the quality of pitches, amongst other things, and there was even talk of installing seating for spectators. However, the question of who was to foot the bill quickly became a divisive issue, with many believing that the government should fund football's development as a national sport. But in the end, the onus fell upon Britain's local and regional football clubs for the funding and development of the Football Association. They became responsible for the upkeep of football grounds, began to pay their best players a small salary, and organised competitions against other local and regional teams. And there began England's Football Association, or the FA, as we know it in its current form, the governing body of football in England. As the FA continued to grow and accumulate greater wealth, it was able to attract more and more talented young men from across the country, before finally accepting professional talent in the early 20th century. Today, football is played at a professional level all over the world. Millions of people regularly go to football stadiums to follow their favourite teams while billions more watch the game on television or on the internet. Welcome, class, to your very first lecture in this series on business in the modern world, conducted by myself, Dr. Toby Bennett. Today, we will be looking into the practice of company outsourcing, using TCP technologies as a case study. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with this practice, I will give you a summative definition. Company outsourcing involves the contracting of various business activities by one company to another. This practice will sometimes occur from a Western company to a party based in a third world country, 
the rationale being to make significant financial savings on lower international labour rates and to potentially increase quality. Now, our case study for today is TCP Technologies, a party located in India that receives outsourced tasks from Western companies. The manager of TCP Technologies is a man called Manjeet Khanna, who has personally developed a series of aims and philosophies by which the company is expected to operate. He claims that the most important of these philosophies is to create a workplace where each individual member has the opportunity to contribute their opinion to the operations of the company. That is to say that he found it important to develop a democratic environment. As a means of ensuring quality from every individual at TCP Technologies, a grading system has been developed that encourages an ethos of hard work and recognizes accomplishment. This grading of individuals is based upon a series of factors such as turnover, hours worked, and efficiency. Every month, Kana publishes the grades on an internal website where staff can access not only their own grades but also compare it to others. A spirit of playful competitiveness has developed through this method which has resulted in increased efficiency and turnover across the company. Kana also saw it as essential to develop a culturally diverse group of employees as a means of presenting a multifaceted image that would appeal to a host of potential employees from across the globe. This cultural openness has not only increased the quantity of incoming contracted opportunities by 7%, but has also benefited the company itself significantly. A level of transparency now exists that had not before been apparent. According to questionnaires carried out recently, these newly introduced measures have significantly increased the rate of staff satisfaction, which has subsequently led to an increase of 32% in the company's income. These figures are truly admirable and serve as a testament to the measures that Kana has introduced to the workplace at TCP Technologies. In a recent interview published by The Economist, he declared, The figures speak for themselves. My system works. When asked if he had any advice for companies on methods they could employ to streamline workflow and increase turnover, he replied, It's simple, really. A company must see itself not as one entity comprised of nameless components, but instead as a living organism composed of cells, each one essential to the functioning of the whole. I suggest that the motto by which your management operates will be Employee First. Many benefits have been reaped from the aforementioned changes in management style, such as a significant decrease in staff turnover. This improvement alone has solved many problems that had before stunted the growth of the company. A lot of these improvements came from the realization that the solution does not have to be produced internally but can come from any other company. The grading system also immeasurably enhanced the dynamics of the company. The fact that this measuring system is solely produced for staff members and inaccessible by management means that it cannot be used as a judging criterion for promotion. It has proven itself a relaxed and informal means of stimulating workflow. When asked about specific features of his managing style, Kana mentioned that it is important for him to respond personally to any complaints filed by staff members. Having found the existing complaints process slow and ineffective, he introduced a new online system that created a direct line of communication between Kana and all employees of the company. The complaint form, dubbed by Kana as a ticket, eradicates the middleman, is easily accessible to all employees online, and has an interface that can be instinctively navigated. Any staff-related complaint, such as those relating to air conditioning and food quality, 
can be submitted directly to CANA via this online system. Entitlement to vacation is also a popular issue discussed through this forum. The main benefit of using this system is that staff must include their personal details on the ticket before they are able to submit it. In the past, anonymous complaints had been the root of much confusion and caused many wasted work hours, so the new system has put a ban on this form of complaint. That wraps up the lecture for today. Please remember that attendance is mandatory. Good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk about the graphical symbol. A graphic symbol is a written symbol that is used to represent speech, such as those used in the Greek alphabet. The term graphic symbol encompasses anything from the logographs used in Egyptian hieroglyphic writing to ancient Chinese pictograms. Early symbols were based on pictographs and ideograms before they were developed into logographic writing systems. These systems are still in use in some non-literate cultures in Africa, the Americas, and Oceania. Indeed, elements of pictography are still found in modern Chinese characters, and it is often an interesting exercise to trace the origins of some Chinese characters. Pictographs remain in common commercial use today as signs, instructions, or statistical diagrams. Road signs and public toilet signs, and even flat pack assembly instructions utilizing pictures, are considered pictographic. Ancient graphic writing systems provide researchers with a wealth of knowledge about past civilizations. In 1799, one of the most important historical discoveries was made by accident when members of Napoleon's expedition to Egypt found a stone in Rosetta that exhibited three different scripts. The stone, now known as the Rosetta Stone, was studied in significant depth by scholars and was first deciphered by Frenchman Jean-François Champollion in 1822. He was able to correctly determine the phonetic values of the symbols and later research has confirmed his findings. In many of these symbols, Lines are used to portray a multitude of meanings, and knowledge and understanding of these lines holds the key to comprehension of graphic writing systems. A key moment in the history of communication was the invention of the camera obscura, or camera. Although the concept can be traced back to the 5th century BC Chinese philosopher Mo Ti, the first photographic image was ultimately created in 1826 by Joseph Nicephore Nicef. Photography, as it was later known, enables researchers to piece together and better understand history. Today, photography forms a huge part of everyday life and most publications contain a vast number of photographs. Photography is used in advertising and is now becoming a way to increase awareness of existing world issues. For example, animal welfare charities are increasingly using photography to advertise animals that are at high risk of endangerment. Charity workers are sometimes flown to far-flung locations to document the suffering endured by high-risk animals in an attempt to raise human awareness of their consumption activities and how they impact others. One recent high-profile campaign was undertaken by attaching a camera to the foot of a bird in order to obtain photographs of the animals in their natural habitats and understand how often they come into contact with human waste. A soon-to-be-released documentary about the suffering of animals on Midway Island shows the full extent to which human consumption is harming animals thousands of miles away from us. As photography continues to progress, with the use of drones now becoming somewhat commonplace, we should expect more and more objects to be included in the future, expanding the horizon of photography ever further. Indeed, the downward pressure on traditional media prices means 
that media companies are being forced to get creative on how to make a profit. Many have found that the answer to this lies in advertising, and companies are now willing to devote a large portion of their budgets to advertising in newspapers. By the same token, marketing has become an essential part of a company's business model, often meaning the success or failure of a company. As a result, much time and money has been pumped into the development of effective branding, with attractive packaging playing a large role in this. However, many governments are now seen to be cracking down on marketing and packaging in an attempt to protect consumers from being misled. In particular, tobacco companies are now subject to ever-increasing regulation. For example, in the United Kingdom, Legislation is soon to pass preventing any form of branding or differentiation on cigarette packaging in efforts to curb the harmful effects of smoking. Finally, one must not forget the fundamental role that graphic writing systems have had to play in mathematics. Graphs, icons and diagrams often form the very basis of these branches of academia. Indeed, one needs to look no further than chemistry's periodic table to see a perfect example of graphic writing systems in use today. Welcome class to your very first lecture in this series on architecture conducted by myself, Dr. Torben Dahl. Today we will be looking into the relationship between climate and architecture where I will be giving you a critical overview of the main climate influences that shape the design of buildings. Throughout this lecture series, we will be looking at the latest research into climatic design carried out by experts in the field, in addition to case studies and examples drawn from modernist practice, both in cities and rural areas. Now, acid rain is one of the climatic elements with the most devastating effects on our architecture. The chemicals in acid rain can cause paint to peel, corrosion of steel structures such as bridges, and erosion of stone statues. Since the 1970s, our government has been making great effort to reduce the release of these chemicals into the atmosphere, with positive results. Private organisations have also been raising awareness and funds, and recently received a huge donation from the bank. It is interesting to look at the studies that have been carried out into the effects of acid rain at varying altitudes. Research has shown that there are lower levels of acid in the damaging pollutants at higher altitudes, meaning that skyscrapers are much less vulnerable to the negative effects as they are exposed to acid rain with far lower levels of damaging pollutants. Recently, the ALTA project was founded to carry out further research into acid rain. This project is directed towards studying the effects of acid rain on old, traditional buildings of stone construction that are vulnerable to damage caused by acid rain. Masonry is particularly vulnerable as it is easily corroded and weakened by the acidic chemicals. It is imperative that we protect these buildings as they are valuable examples of our history and culture. Pollution is one of the main sources of concern in the present day. The construction industry contributes considerably as a source of pollution in its day-to-day -day processes of creating building materials such as concrete and glass. However, more new sustainable methods are being developed to counter this. A recent case study for this is Sky Tower, whose windows have been made from recycled glass to prevent pollution from the glass-making process. Water is the most problematic element to be considered in construction. It is imperative that construction elements, such as the insulation, are fitted into the building in dry weather to prevent it from getting wet. This makes winter an undesirable season for construction as the heavy rainfall can have adverse effects on the building. Another climate type that has an enormous effect on buildings is humidity. 
Constructions made of steel and stone are largely unaffected by humidity. However, it can have a serious effect on wooden constructions if the timber has not been correctly treated. Moisture from the air can condense in the grain of the wood, which then swells and shrinks in proportion to the magnitude of change in its moisture content. This variation in size can have disastrous consequences. In areas of the world that are prone to earthquakes, certain design and environmental conditions are preferable for protecting buildings in the event of a tremor. Engineers have come up with numerous building procedures to help minimize shaking in buildings. For example, tall buildings have height restrictions and counterweights, and multi-story buildings have reinforced floors and walls. Ground conditions are a cause for worry in many constructions, as often the soil is of the wrong density to protect the foundations. Luckily, technology has now been developed that can help to minimize damage by earthquakes. Seismic sensors can give prior warning when an earthquake is about to happen, so that preparations can be made to protect both the people and the buildings from harm. The movement of building structures can now also be measured and monitored over time by architects. It has been expressed by architects within the design community that it would be valuable to be given special courses for designing buildings within earthquake zones. Guidelines are also expected to be produced by the government in the near future that will give architects a universal checklist to follow. That wraps up the lecture for today. Please remember that attendance is mandatory. In the last few lectures, I've been talking about the history of technology in the modern world. But today, I want to use Roberts as our case study, which is a company that develops complex camera technology for a range of industries and disciplines. Since the camera was invented in 1816, it has changed and improved dramatically with cameras now in existence that can fit on the head of a pin. The company has been founded on a series of principles by which the company operates in its day-to-day -day business, the most important of these being to enhance the present development of camera technology. Roberts has a philosophy pioneering innovation, having been responsible for the invention of numerous technologies since it was founded by Duane Roberts in 1957. It has achieved many of its aims over the years, but its principles and founding aim persists through time, which is to explore new facts and imagine the unimaginable. The cameras produced by Roberts have a multitude of potential applications that are currently being explored. One of these is an anti-gravity camera that they aim to attach to a space satellite from where it will record live high-definition video and provide fascinating new views of planet Earth. It could also prove useful in exploring other planets by providing researchers with never-before-seen images of the universe. Roberts are also experimenting with attaching the cameras to small drones that will fly through the rainforest in search of plants that could be used to develop future medicine. The camera also has the potential to be used on the roads. As it is 20% cheaper than the speed cameras that are currently in operation, this means that more of them could be distributed across the road network where they can control traffic by making sure that all cars abide by the speed regulations. Despite this diverse range of potential applications, the cameras are presently used for very different, more domestic purposes. Robert's cameras are presently used as nanny cams, which allow parents to watch their nannies to ensure that they are responsibly attending to the children that they have been employed to care for. These cameras give parents peace of mind and more control over their child's welfare whilst they are at work or otherwise occupied. The highest sales of the company are in toys, that have the cameras hidden within them. This clever idea means that the cameras are camouflaged from view and do not look out of place in the child's nursery. The toys are also very robust, 
so children can play with them without damaging them in the process. The toys are designed to look like animals and come in a range of shapes, sizes and colours, as well as different animal species such as monkeys and bears. These toys are incredibly popular and can be bought in any toy store for only $20. Always eager to be constantly improving their products, Roberts are now working on a product that will change the way people see photography. This new contraption is a mini camera that is built into eyewear such as glasses and sunglasses where it can capture the world as you see it. Holiday makers and tourists no longer have to carry a big heavy camera around with them on their travels. They can instead purchase a set of eyewear with the built-in camera which will capture the moment with a simple tap. Roberts are also developing a model of this tiny camera for use during medical procedures and operations. The camera will be used during non-invasive keyhole surgeries to enable the surgeon to see what they are doing inside the body without having to make a large incision. This innovative application for the camera could make surgeries a lot faster and the save time and energy will also make it far more efficient. As the patient will no longer have to undergo a large incision for their surgery, it also means that their recovery will be much faster with a greatly reduced chance of post-op infection. If any of you have an interest in working in this field of technological invention, Roberts is a very diverse and fast-growing company that would be a fantastic internship opportunity. Every year they organize a series of competitions where entrants stand the chance of winning a place in their internship program. So I would suggest that all of you enter. That wraps up the lecture for today. Please remember that attendance is mandatory. Good morning, everyone. Today's lecture is about a type of adorable animal, the penguin. When you think of penguins, you may picture them surrounded by snow and ice. But not all penguins live where it's cold. African penguins live in the southern tip of Africa. They are usually found within 40 kilometers of the shore and on a number of its surrounding islands. African penguins are also known as jackass penguins because they make donkey-like braying sounds to communicate. African penguins can keep their body temperature at a stable level, but their land habitat can get quite warm, so there are a number of ways for them to stay cool. They limit their daylight movements on breeding sites on land to early mornings and early evenings to avoid too much sun. The pink glands above their eyes can help them cope with the temperate climates. Like other penguins, African penguins spend most of the day feeding in the ocean, which also helps keep them cool. Being a type of small to medium-sized penguin species, African penguins average about 60 centimetres tall and weigh up to 3.6 kilograms. They have a black stripe and a pattern of unique black spots on their chest. Males are larger than females and have larger beaks. Even though they are categorised as birds, African penguins aren't able to fly because of their heavy bones. Their wings are more like flippers that make them particularly suited for life in the water. When they're on land, their flippers and their tails help them keep their balance and walk upright. African penguins begin to breed at the average age of four. When a male and female pair up, they tend to breed together for the rest of their lives. Most other penguins nest and lay their eggs out in the open, but African penguins have a different approach. They dig holes under bushes out of their own excrement, called guano, so they are sheltered from the sun and predators. The African penguins survive on a diet that is comprised mainly of marine organisms. They feed primarily on fish like sardines, along with the occasional squid and shellfish. But when normal food is in short supply, they eat tree roots as well. The streamlined body of the African penguin allows it to move through the water like a rocket, capable of reaching a speed of around 20 kilometers per hour when hunting for food. The African penguin's smaller size means that it has many predators, both in the water and also on dry land. 
Their natural predators at sea include seals and sharks. The biggest threat to them on land is not just towards the adult penguins. The penguin chicks are sometimes taken by seagulls into the air and dropped from above. The seagulls could thus feed on them. At risk from predators, young penguins are protected for about 40 days after hatching by both parents. They will leave the colony when they are between three to five months old and will return a few years later. The entire surface of their body is densely covered with feathers which fall off during the winter. This process is called molting and takes about three weeks to complete. During that time, they are unable to forage. Therefore, prior to this, African penguins spend about five weeks laying down fat deposits. They generally live between 10 to 15 years. However, many do not reach their full lifespan. Their population has drastically declined. Approximately 120,000 African penguins remain in the wild and their population has decreased by 90% in the past 60 years. They are considered to be vulnerable and have been listed as being endangered. Two major factors have contributed to their decline. They are struggling for nesting space due to human disruption and competing for food due to overfishing and pollution. With the limited number of breeding pairs, survivorship becomes difficult for African penguins. This makes them especially vulnerable as environmental conditions change or an outbreak of a disease occurs. For instance, avian malaria has caused 27% of the captive breeding penguins' deaths annually. The more genetic diversity there is within a species, the higher the likelihood that at least some of the individuals will adapt and survive. Good afternoon and welcome to my talk on urban migration today. The world has experienced unprecedented urban growth in the recent decade. As much as 3% of Earth's landmass has been urbanized, an increase of at least 50% over previous estimates. Today, people living in cities already outnumber those in rural areas and the trend does not appear to be reversing. In addition, cities have larger amounts of carbon consumption than rural areas. This is a result from two major aspects. First, with the increase of urban population around the world, the massive construction of urban infrastructure and residential housing is hard to avoid. Second, urban households have a higher rate of car ownership and use more gasoline products. Even though rural exodus is often negatively judged, there are also benefits of migration shared by the local environment and the society as a whole. Well, firstly, global trends of increasing urban migration and population urbanization can provide opportunities for nature conservations, particularly in regions where deforestation is driven by agriculture. As rural dwellers leave their homes, local forests are left to recover. What's more, it is easier for city dwellers to get around. Living in the country means transport can be very difficult. For instance, after midnight, there are no buses or taxis in the countryside. However, there is still a number of public transport modes to choose from in the city. Finally, with more funds and advanced technology, cities endeavor to produce clean energy New power plants have been built to take harmful methane gas created by the decomposition of rubbish and convert it into electricity. By doing so, an important greenhouse gas is turned into useful energy rather than being directly emitted into the atmosphere. The hustle and bustle of city life offers women the opportunity to explore different professions and pursue their own careers. Women in cities work as engineers, managers, and even football players. This change of roles has affected their marital status and family life. More women are choosing their careers over marriage, which raises the graph of late marriages. As a result, more are remaining single well into their late 30s. They want to be independent and earn money on their own. It is also easier for them to get a promotion while working in the city. 
women are slowly achieving wider participation at work, while in rural areas the mindset is still very conservative. However, cities also change the way that humans interact with each other and the environment, often causing multiple problems. In general, urban wages are significantly higher, so moving to the city is an opportunity to earn what was impossible in rural areas. However, the wage difference is often offset by the higher cost of living and absence of self-produced goods, including substance farming. A sizable proportion of new corners attach greater importance to money and gradually abandon their former way of life, thus risking losing their culture. These new city residents are also faced with another problem. According to statistics, crime rates are significantly higher in densely populated urban regions than in rural areas. For instance, Property crime rates in our metropolitan areas are three to four times as high in comparison to the rates in rural communities. Immigrants upon arrival into cities typically move into the poor, blighted neighborhoods because that is where they can afford to live. Crime in these areas is high and reflects poor living conditions as these neighborhoods experience great levels of poverty. This pattern also occurs for violent crimes, which is much more common in large urban areas than elsewhere. In addition, traffic congestion and industrial manufacturing are prominent features of the urban landscape, which take their toll on the natural environment and those who depend on it. Air pollution from both cars and factory emissions affect the health of countless urban residents. Rural to urban migration can boost the urban economy. With a better economy, cities provide their residents with better welfare. But the concentration of services and facilities such as education, health and technology in urban areas inevitably contributes to greater energy consumption. Another problem with life in the city is traffic congestion. It makes people late to work and thus stresses us out before we even get there. Deliveries can't arrive on time, gas costs money, the quality of life of those commuters starts to decline. What's worse is that if congestion makes it harder to match the right workers to the best jobs, it is economically inefficient as well. So, what I'm going to talk about to you today is something called aquaculture. It has been responsible for the impressive growth in the supply of fish for human consumption. There's also been a slight improvement in the state of certain fish stocks due to improved fishery management. Aquatic food production has transitioned from being primarily based on the capturing of wild fish to the culture of increasing numbers of farmed species. In recent years, a type of genetically modified salmon has been farmed in the New England region, produced by a Massachusetts-based biotech firm. This type of fish is engineered to grow twice as fast as its conventional farm-raised counterpart. As a result, this increases the speed of the local aquaculture industry development, and thus reduces the fishing pressure on wild stock. But local residents have expressed their concerns on the potential negative effects on the ecosystem should those GM fish ever escape into the sea. Stronger, healthier and faster growing, these fish might cannibalize others or outcompete wild type fish for food. Local decision makers and regulators have thus pushed forward a number of measures, making it impossible for most GM fish to mate. A small percentage is able to breed only within confined pools. Despite the economic boom of genetically engineered fish, culturing traditional types of fish is still mainstream among fish farmers. Most of them prefer fish with special features, such as tuna. It is a source of high quality protein with almost no fat. It also contains all essential amino acids required by the body for growth and maintenance of lean muscle tissue. 
With high nutritional value, this kind of fish will always be popular in the fish market. For the fish farming industry, incidents of fish escaping the farms has been a troubling issue over the years. Due to bad weather, nets that used to hold the fish were often destroyed. Thousands of salmon worth nearly 220,000 euros escaped from a fish farm in the Norwegian region in July, raising fear that they would breed with wild fish stocks. Cages were thus built to withstand storms. The frames of the cages are made of PE, which is dedicated to marine use. This material has trustable strength, resilience and tenacity. To further strengthen it, strong nets without knots are used to support the cylindrical frame. A group of small villages on the island of Zanzibar off the coast of East Africa have been trying to develop a local aquaculture industry sustainably. They use a land-based production system that is both economically and ecologically sound. Land-based recirculation can control ocean temperature and optimize growth for the fish that are used to warmer water. All organic waste from the fish is held on land, with incoming water sterilized to avoid disease, which has historically plagued ocean-based farms. The lack of disease means that no drugs are administered to the fish. However, one problem facing the villagers is lack of suitable land on the coast for this system. Hotels and beaches open to tourists take up most of the coastal area. Another problem facing local fishermen is the scarcity of young fish used to breed the species. This predicament stems from overfishing during the previous decades. The local commercial fishing industry has been reduced by 50% for this reason, and the aquaculture industry has yet to thrive. The government has taken a set of initiatives to safeguard native aquaculture and the fishing industry. An open-air seafood market has been launched. Residents are encouraged to support local fish farming businesses by purchasing marine products. As it turns out, there is a public demand for access to locally produced, sustainable sources of fresh seafood. Moreover, local fish farmers are aided to market seaweed and oysters, both of which have additional economic values. Seaweed is used in various ways in cosmetics. Seaweed extract is often found on the list of ingredients constituting creams, soaps, shampoos, powders and sprays. It is said to be useful in various ways including the relief of rheumatic pain and the removal of cellulite. Oyster is a source of seafood popular among the local hospitality industry. Served with caviar and champagne, it is one of the world's ultimate luxury foods, appealing to gourmets with its succulent and delicate flavor. It thus appears to have the greatest potential for commercial culture, even though the national and international market has shown demand for marine products in Zanzibar. It is still challenging to survive in the competitive modern fishing industry. The government ought to restore the business by encouraging aquaculture, recreation and shipping. First, it could utilize modern fish farming technology to supply more high quality marine products. Tourism is an effective stimulus to boost its sales and with better shipping capability, more products can be delivered abroad. Good morning everyone. Today, I'm going to talk about the research project I've been involved in on time measurement. Do you know how time is measured? Consider how we measure length and how with time we encounter a difficulty. Before we could grasp it, it would slip through our fingers. In fact, as we can see, we are forced to have the resource to measure something else. The movement of something in space or a set of movements in space. All the methods that have been employed so far really measure time by a motion in space. The measurement of time is no easy matter, a scientific unit only arrived at after much thought and reflection. As the most primitive form of measurement, the sun seems to be natural. Ever since man first noticed the regular movements of the sun and stars, we have wondered about the passage of time. 
Prehistoric people first recorded time according to the sun's position. To start off, let us take noon, which is when the sun is on the meridian at the highest point of its course across the heavens, and when it casts the shortest shadow. But this measurement, which was regarded as a major one in ancient times, was less important than the natural events that occurred. The earliest natural events that had been recognised were in the heavens, but during the course of the year, there were many other events that indicated significant changes in the environment. Seasonal winds and rains, the flooding of rivers, the flowering of trees and plants, and the breeding cycles or migration of animals all led to natural divisions of the year, and the further observation and local customs led to the recognition of the seasons. Years later, precise measurements were invented because the passage of time was extremely important for astronomers and priests who were responsible for determining the exact hour for daily rituals and for important religious festivals. Apart from the connection with religion, accurate time measurement was also related to the government, since they divided the day or the night into different periods in order to regulate work and various events. For thousands of years, devices had been used to measure and keep track of time. The current sexagesimal system of time measurement dates back to approximately 2000 BCE from the Sumerians. It was found that the earliest ancient timekeepers were mainly invented and used in Mesopotamia, where the water clock was introduced from, as well as in North Africa, especially in the area of ancient Egypt. So, now I'd like to introduce you to some of the most well-known ancient timekeepers, as well as the disadvantages of them, for which they were replaced by various new forms of clocks that were used afterwards. A sundial is a device that tells the time of day by the apparent positioning of the sun in the sky. In the narrowest sense of the word, it consists of a flat plate and a gnomon which casts a shadow onto the dial. As the sun appears to move across the sky, the shadow aligns with different hour lines which are marked on the dial to indicate the time of day. However, it was quickly noted that the length of the day varied at different times of the year. Therefore, there could have been a difference between clock time and sundial time. In addition, the sundial was of no use at night, so a water clock was invented. The water clock or clepsydra, appeared to have been invented around 1500 BCE and was a device which relied on the steady flow of water from or into a container. Measurements could be marked on the container or on a receptacle for the water. It was reliable, but the water flow still depended on the variation of pressure and temperature from the top of water in the container. As the technology of glass blowing developed, from some time in the 14th century, it became possible to make sand glasses. Originally, they were used as a measurement for periods of time like lamps or candles. But as clocks became more accurate, they were calibrated to measure specific periods of time. The drawback, however, as you can imagine, was the limited length of time they could measure. The last timekeeper to be introduced is the fire candle clock. Candle clocks took advantage of a simple concept, the slow and consistent nature of a burning wax candle. By utilising this process, our ancestors were able to keep steady track of the time. The clocks were created by engraving the length of the candle with evenly spaced markings. Each marking represented a single unit of time, and, as the wax burned down, each hour would disappear. However, the drafts and the variable quality of the wax mainly influenced the time of burning. Like oil lamps, candles were used to mark the passage of time from one event to another rather than tell the time of day. So, what I'm going to talk about to you today is something called tea tree oil, which was first extracted from Melaleuca altenifolia in Australia. This species remains the most important commercially. Several other species are cultivated for their oil extraction. There is a very long history of tea tree oil's use in aromatherapy. Traditionally, Melaleuca altenifolia leaves were crushed and the oil was inhaled by the Aborigines of Australia for the treatment of coughs, 
colds, and also for the treatment of wounds. For instance, they chewed the young leaves to alleviate headaches and took them to treat sore throats or skin ailments. The Aborigines' world was discovered by Willem Janssoon, a Dutch explorer who was the first European to sail to Australia. In 1606, he reached the northern coast of Australia in his ship. Then several voyages of exploration followed in the first half of the 17th century. The Dutch found it a paradise on earth for man's well-being, with timber, stone, and lime for building. There was also plenty of salt, and the coast was full of fish. Besides, they found the characteristics of the diet there because they happened to meet ten naked black Aborigines having a meal in the open air. While the value of tea tree oil originated from Australia, it was gradually known and tested by the outsiders. In the middle of the 18th century, Sir Hugh Palliser, an officer of the British Royal Navy who had been to Australia several times during that period. Got serious injuries all over due to his experiences in several wars. For more than the last fifteen or sixteen years of his life, he seldom lay down in a bed because of the constant pain in his leg. Then he tried tea tree oil, as it was said that tea tree oil could operate as a very powerful immunostimulant for pre and post surgical care. The use of the name tea tree, also called paper bark trees. Probably originated from Captain James Cook's description he made soon after he had arrived at the coast of New South Wales in 1770. At the time, he witnessed some Aborigines of Australia using one of the shrubs' leaves to make an infused drink in place of tea. In the 1920s, some human clinical research and the documentation of many benefits associated with tea tree oil were credited, which were made by Dr. Arthur Penfold, an Australian government chemist. He investigated the business potential of a number of native extracted oils, then reported that tea tree oil was promising as it exhibited powerful antiseptic properties. But after World War II, the entry of antibiotics declined the use of natural products in medicine, which had a negative effect on the production of tea tree oil. As such an important and valuable material in the world, how is tea tree oil produced? I think most of you are curious about this. Tea tree oil can be extracted in some different ways, but the most traditional way is steam distillation. Once harvested in winter, when the amount of required essence in oil meets the needs for production, the finely cut trees are transported to a steam distillation facility. The extraction is made by distilling the leaves in specially designed stainless steel stills, along with the stems, to yield pure oil. The water-filled boiler is heated and constantly monitored to maintain the correct temperature. Both the steam and oil evaporate and then condense as they run through a pipe into the collecting container, where the oil floats to the lid, while the water, because of gravity, goes steadily out the lower exit pipe. At the end of the hour, the oil is siphoned off through the upper pipe, while the condensed steam floats through the lower pipe towards the ground. At the end of each distillation, all the spent plant material is hauled out of the still pot by hand with a short rake, piled onto a trailer, and spread where required as a thick woody mulch. Good morning, class. In the last few lectures, I've talked about the history of technology in the business area, but today I want to use Samuel Cunard as our case study. Who was a shipping magnate that founded the Cunard Line? Now, Cunard was born in Canada. When he first left home, he was still a teenager. Then he came into a U.S. company as a worker and learned how to sail there. During the War of 1812, Cunard volunteered for service in the Second Battalion of the Halifax Regiment Militia and rose to the rank of captain. He held many public offices, such as volunteer fireman and lighthouse commissioner, and maintained a reputation as not only a shrewd businessman but also an honest and generous citizen. When he went to England, his friends cooperated with him, and together they coined a shipping company. The company had instant wealth and could deal with more than one cargo, for its major business was in North America and the Atlantic. 
From then onwards, Cunard became a highly successful entrepreneur in British shipping and one of a group of 12 individuals who dominated the affairs of England. In 1838, the British government, impressed by the advantages of steam sailing for making regular passages, invited tenders to carry the transatlantic mails by steamer. Back then, mail contact through steamships brought more punctuality, while other types of ships were always delayed. The journey times were flexible, with a transatlantic crossing lasting for six weeks and with no fixed times of departure or arrival so it was never known when the mail would arrive, or, since so many sailing ships foundered, whether it would arrive at all. What Cunard wanted, in line with the thrusting new technology of the Victorian age, was a maritime extension of the brand, new timetabled railways on land. Cunard's experience in steamship operation, with observations of the growing railway network in England, encouraged him to explore the creation of a transatlantic fleet of steamships, which would cross the ocean as regularly as trains crossed land, and that's why he went to the United Kingdom seeking investors in 1837. He set up a company with several other businessmen to bid for the rights to run a transatlantic mail service between the UK and North America for £55,000 annually for 10 years. The bid was successful. Almost at the same time, Cunard cooperated with an English businessman and established the British and North American Royal Mail Steam Packet Company, the ancestor of the Cunard line. In 1840, the company's first steamship sailed from Liverpool to Boston, Massachusetts, with Cunard and 63 other passengers on board, marking the beginning of regular passenger and cargo service. Establishing a long, unblemished reputation for speed and safety, Cunard's company made ocean liners a success in the face of many potential rivals who lost ships and fortunes. Cunard's ships proved successful, and he then opened many branches. But the high cost saddled Cunard with heavy debts by 1842, so some of them went bankrupt. But what Cunard needed then was a port. After a lot of consideration, he finally opted for Boston because he was very familiar with this city where he had once worked it. Fortunately, by 1843, Cunard ships were earning enough to pay off his debts and begin issuing modest but growing dividends. But the city did more than give Cunard silverware. Winters can be tough here in Boston. For example, in the year of 1844, one ship sank because of the winter freeze. The ship hit icebergs and caused a heavy loss to the company. Then, the board recommended the company to move to New York, and it was a huge success, and then became one of the biggest US shipping companies. Cunard himself made safety his priority, and to this day, Cunard has never been responsible for the loss of a single passenger or a single mailbag on the Atlantic run. Cunard's conservative nature enabled his company to see off rivals and to take a measured and steady approach when it came to the introduction of new technology like radio communication. In the early years of his career, Cunard took a prominent part in community activities and various charitable organisations, as well as mercantile affairs which extended throughout the Atlantic provinces. Back then, there were hardly any entertainment facilities on board. In order to make sure that the passengers could have a comfortable journey, newspapers were printed on board. Cunard was gratefully remembered for employing his capital in shipbuilding activities in the hard times of the 1830s because this enterprise had circulated money where there would otherwise be poverty and stagnation. His competitiveness and his obsession not to waste time were important characteristics of his personality. Prior to 1912, the shipping line had focused on speed and soon was renowned for its velocity and safety. Although early in life Cunard was imperious, he learned diplomacy and became a skillful and persuasive negotiator. His contemporaries admired him for the contribution to transatlantic communication by the line popularly called by his name. After that, for affluent transatlantic passengers, Cunard brought new levels of luxury to ocean travel, 
lavish suites, a swimming pool, gymnasium, ballroom, electricity and more. Just like that of luxurious hotels. Okay, so does anyone have any...